So we need to talk a little bit about perception. What is perception all about? Well, there's two ways of thinking about perception traditionally that Merleau-Ponty is going to reject and find a kind of third way in between. The first way is going to be, uh, and this will come up more and more as we go through the, the coming weeks. So just by way of preview, the first way is the intellectualist or the rationalist or the idealist way of thinking about perception, where what we have is a bunch of disconnected mental images and our mind or our rationality comes in and connects them into a world. And so the world is kind of being constructed by our minds. That's the idealist way of thinking about it. The other way, the sort of empiricist way of thinking about it is no, the world is already out there, unified, all on its own, without anyone perceiving it whatsoever. And we come in and our mental states kind of recover somehow that preformed world. So these are the two ways that Merleau-Ponty is going to reject and say these are, there's a kind of kernel of truth in each of these, but we need to bring these together in a particular way and find a third way. So he's going to give his, his discussion of what he thinks perception is all about. So I've, I've highlighted this particular passage. So he's in particular talking against the idealist conception of perception here. He says the real is to be described and neither constructed nor constituted. So he's saying the, the perception is not constructing the world the way the idealist thinks it is. Why does he think that perception is not constructing the world? Well, here's his reason. I cannot assimilate to percep I cannot assimilate perception to syntheses that belong to the order of judgment, acts, or predication. At each moment, my perceptual field is filled with reflections, sudden noises, and fleeting tactile impressions that I am unable to link to the perceived context and that nevertheless I immediately place in the world without ever confusing them with my daydreams. At each instant, I weave dreams around the things. I imagine objects or people whose presence here is not incompatible with the context, and yet they are not confused with the world. They are out in front of the world, on the stage of the imaginary. If the reality of my perception were based solely on the intrinsic coherence of representations, as the idealist has it, then it should always be, I should always be hesitant and Delivered over to my probable conjectures, I ought to be continuously dismantling illu illusory syntheses and reintegrating into the real aberrant phenomena that I may have at first excluded. So what he's saying is, look, if the idealist was right, perception would be this sort of probabilistic conjecture. I would be unsure at all times whether something is real or not. I'd have to kind of calculate out whether this is real. And that's not the way it is. The world just is there. It just appears to us. This is never the case. The real is a tightly woven fabric. It does not wait for our judgment in order to incorporate the most surprising of phenomena, nor to reject the most convincing of our imaginings. There's a, an immediate distinction between imagination and perception, and that just wouldn't be true if we were always, con if we were always constructing the world. Um, it, would be, it would go a lot differently. So Merleau-Ponty is asking the idealist, he's challenging the idealist, he's saying, if we're constructing the world based on, so on uh, what is more coherent, right? How do, we tell, how do we tell dreams and imaginations apart from reality? Well, the idealist would say, well, the, the perception of reality is more coherent than the dream. And if um, Merleau-Ponty is saying, no, no, there's something much more going on there. Uh, at each moment, my perceptual field is filled with things that I can't immediately place. And it's not like those, in, those incompatible things make me question reality. Um, I'm, I'm able to discern very clearly, even when something surprises me, I'm able to say that's part of reality. It's not just something I'm imagining. So, for example, if you're walking down the street and expecting um, your friend to meet you, and instead you come to find, say, they're throwing a surprise party for you. And there's a moment where you have to think, this isn't at all what I expected. It's not coherent with the sequence that I had, in, had, had judged to be true. But I'm not just daydreaming or imagining all these people. They're really there. So 
something different is going on than the idealist picture. Think also about the saying that reality is stranger than fiction. The real world doesn't need our minds to grasp it in order to be real. But if the idealist was right, we would need to have some coherent picture or judgment about the world in order to see that it's real. But strange things happen all the time uh, that we have no way of really understanding. So it can't be that our mind is constructing reality out of the things that we understand. So perception isn't that way. Um, now the next few pages are are very difficult, and he goes back into from talking about perception. He kind of goes kind of back to talking about phenomenological method. He's making reference to the cogito here, which is uh, a reference to Descartes. We talked about this in class, but the basic idea behind the cogito is Descartes' famous pronouncement that "I think I exist" is certainly true. Descartes goes through a process of doubt. He tries to doubt everything that he can. And he says, the one thing that I can't doubt is that I exist. Because as I'm trying to doubt whether I exist, something is there doing the doubting. So I can't coherently doubt my existence. Because the very process of doubting the existence implies that I'm there existing, doing the doubting. So that's what, whenever he says cogito, that's what um, Merleau-Ponty has in mind. So what's going on here in these passages? I'll read uh, briefly. The true cogito does not define the existence of the subject through the thought that the subject has of existing. So it's not, I think, therefore I exist. Um, Descartes had something like that, but he's saying the true cogito. So I'm going to say Descartes had something really important but he didn't fully understand exactly what he was breaking through to with the cogito. So the true cogito does not define the existence of the subject through the thought that the subject has of existing, does not convert the certainty of the world into a certainty of the thought about the world, and finally does not replace the world itself with the signification world. So it's not that we're sort of replacing the world with a linguistic construct, um, and it's not that we can only be certain of the about the world through thinking about it. We're certain of the world not through thinking about it, but through living in it. That's that's the point there. Not through talking about it, but through living in it. Rather, the true cogito recognizes my thought as an inalienable fact, and it eliminates all forms of idealism by revealing me as being in the world. So what's going on here? He's bringing out the importance of Husserl's concept of horizon when he talks about being in the world. We just talked about Horizon. We talked a lot about it over the first weeks of the semester, and we just talked about it uh, a few minutes ago in this video. Um, but so if Descartes had been, so Descartes, what happens in Descartes? What happens with the Cogito? Well, Descartes says, I think, therefore, I exist. It's certainly true that I exist. But then he says, I don't know whether anything else exists. I'm, I'm stuck in this sort of island of my own. I or my own consciousness. I don't know whether the world exists yet. And so he has to go through the remaining uh, meditations to find out whether the world exists. And Merleau-Ponty is saying that's a faulty way of going about things. If, for, if Descartes had been doing the phenomenology, he would have seen that by the horizon structure, his own existence implies the existence of the world. That's because I am being in the world. Every act of consciousness is situated within the horizon. So that's what Merleau-Ponty is saying over these, the course of the few pages that I've drawn this passage from. And this is supposed to shed more light on Husserl's method of phenomenological reduction. Every act of consciousness is a movement towards the world by virtue of this horizon structure. It's never just a, a lonely eye or a lonely act of consciousness. It's always an act of consciousness embedded in a total horizon that stretches out into the life world. Uh, so the, the reduction doesn't get rid of the world or our movement toward the world, uh, but instead it tries to step back of it and catch sight of it by refusing to take part. 